Welcome, welcome. Hello, Global Citizen. Hello to our live streaming audience on Bloomberg Television. Hello, everyone in this real audience who have just been satiated by your caffeine, your food, your drinks. We are welcoming some good energy because we're about to tackle one of the hottest topics in the investing world right now, ESG. It's environmental, it's social, it's governance, investing. It's become politicized most recently. And it's, though, been around for years. Boardrooms all over the world are having to navigate this, with executives discussing how they can be better stewards of the resources that they depend upon. So let's talk about it. And I'm pleased to say that I'm going to hurl this political football, and it's become one of those, to you, Fran, first and foremost, because I know you are going to tackle elephants in the room head on. I passed you the ball, and I ask you, how are your own stakeholders thinking about this? How are you navigating what has become deeply politicized? Well, it depends. And I think there's a lot of danger, I have to say, in the term ESG. And the reason for it is it's not understood. And so I think what's most important and the way that you bring people along with you and try to remove some of the stigma here is you just focus on the work. Mm -hmm. And if you think about companies, companies want to do good for the world. Um, if you ask a company, do you want to do your part to ensure that we have a planet as we move forward? Do you want to ensure that we have a planet for our children? Do you want to make changes in how you run your business that could be really good? What you'll see is that a lot of companies want to do this. If you ask companies, do you want to have fairness? Do you want to have diversity? Do you want to pay people fairly for the work that they do? The answer is yes. And so what I find is that when we get specific, when we talk about the issues, we remove a lot of that. Now, not all companies will approach the work in the same way, and right. I think that's good. It has to be authentic. Um, the way in which Cisco shows up, as an example, from a sustainability perspective, is as a hardware company that builds technology, and what we're finding is that if we can build our technology in ways where our customers have to use less energy, that's compelling for us from a business perspective. And so we believe okay. that there is this balance of doing good for the world and good for business. But Nir, your clients, they need the money to be made. And are you finding clients are ultimately being thoughtful about the way in which that, that impacts the world or not? Or do you have to say, look, first and foremost, we make you profit, and then we think about what the impact is? So first of all, I thought that was very wise, and I agree with a lot of what Fran said. And uh, let me take a step back for a second. So, you know, there's so much happening in the world. Uh, and I think a lot of people think that you can separate somehow the topics that we've been discussing here over the last couple of days, women's rights, poverty, climate change, from business, from the economy, from macro and micro economy. But the truth is these things are deeply, deeply, deeply interconnected. So one, there's just recognizing that reality. At Bridgewater, we focus on things because of one of two reasons. Either because they understand to some, they matter for somebody who's trying to understand how the world works, mm -hmm. or because our clients, like you're saying, they care about it. As they're deploying their capital, they care. They have goals beyond their returns that they want, they want to measure against, uh, they, want, they want to be measured against. And the thing that I think is very important to realize, not just that it's, it's people see and understand it differently, um, but it's also that there's levels of complexities around these problems. And we just here over the last couple of days, we've heard people that think about impact investing and saying, you know, we should not invest in fossil fuels. And in the same panel, we heard people saying, well, natural gas is actually really important as a transition source of energy. You can hear people say mining you know, is, is something that we should really divest from, but it's really hard to imagine how we're going to build electric cars if we don't mine. So really being thoughtful about what it means to invest through the lens of impact is something that I think requires a lot of thought to do well. And Bridgewater has been focusing a lot on paving the path for what sustainable and impact-led investing could look like. But when you say the word sustainable, does that automatically make you a bit of a political pinata? So I agree with Fran completely on that point. I think the more we make this a political issue, the less we're getting to truth and the less we're actually paving paths of understanding of people in their own ways, with their own set of goals, uh, making progress towards those goals. And it's kind of the problem that we have in the world, right? The problem that we have in the world is that we politicize so many things that if we don't politicize them, we can bring large groups of people 
to align themselves against these goals like Global Citizens has been doing for the last 10 years. Seppo, talk to us about, there is that tension. We're just hearing about you have to mine to have EVs. You have to build infrastructure across Africa that is in energy infrastructure, that is transportation infrastructure, that many would say is synonymous with an impact on carbon. How do you align yourself with a race to zero at the same time as having to invest across a nation? I think uh, all those issues, and, but prior to that, I also want to just touch on the sustainability issue and talking about infrastructure and talking about the long-term issues that you then have to then take into cognizance as you do that and the politicization of all those issues and just energy transition that you have to take into account. And when you then have to like factor into that whole equation, also the whole issue that like, you know, the, the developing economies that you have to take into account, it becomes a whole minefield that you have to like, you know, traverse when you have to do that. And the whole sustainability issue, and, but as you say, companies want to do well. People want to do well. But I think when you think about sustainability, you are a committed corporate. If you are a committed corporate and you think in that manner and you think about, you know, a legacy that you want to leave behind, you yeah. plan in that manner, you will then structure yourself in a manner that ensures that whatever you are doing will still be there in the next 30, 40, 50 years, and even for the next generation. So therefore, whatever you do, you ensure that even the, let's say if you're building a, a, uh, a wind power project, and it's in a rural area in, uh, in northern Kenya, that the nomadic sort of like, you know, uh, uh, farmers there that they can still continue with their grazing, that their water holes can still be protected. So you have to take into account all those issues and still be sustainable for your project and your investors must like do that. So there's a way that if you want to be that good citizen, you can balance those issues and sort of like you know, manage the kind of like uh, mm. uh, challenges that that comes with. Fran, I think wind farms, I think innovation, I think synonymous with Silicon Valley, Cisco's home. What real innovations are you being forced to come up with in the face of climate, in the face of poverty? Well, I would tell you there are so many amazing innovations that are happening. Like when we talk about agriculture, the ability for us to leverage IoT to reduce water usage is amazing. And, and so that's one example. Um, I will tell you that from a Cisco perspective, we see so many opportunities as it relates to the carbon footprint and energy usage for our customers. And what they're telling us is that if we can help them meet their goals, their net zero goals, they're willing to pay more for that. And so from a business perspective, that's amazing. And leaning into how we help them solve their issues um, is critical. The only other thing that I would add to this is that when you look around the world, country by country, the approach is a bit different. Um, we see Europe truly leaning in. Um, and right now, for a global company, to bid for business in many European countries, you have to demonstrate that you're doing work from a sustainability perspective and from a social impact perspective. And so to be your best, you're going to have to lean in and play. But again, I think the innovation piece is an unlock where it demonstrates that it can be incredibly meaningful for companies too. But near technology, innovation is being bifurcated. Trade is being bifurcated. Is there a risk that so too does asset allocation into sustainable investments and infrastructure? Yeah. I mean, again, I think it goes back to the the problem the world is facing more broadly, and I worry about it. I worry about the politicization. I worry about us not having the right conversation with investors around what it means to invest in an impactful way. Um, so I think really focusing on building, looking through the no uh, is going to shape what impact investing looks like over the next uh, 10, 20 years. How do you educate your investor right now? How do you sit down with a treasurer or someone heading up a pension fund who's like, look, I just need the most amount of bang for the buck right now. I'm going to put sustainability to one side. Do you still serve them? 
Yes, because um, again, I think the way to do this isn't to lecture people. I think that's, that would be a part of... Go to technical. <laughs> uh, I think that would be a part of politicizing this. I think for us, we learn as much from our clients as we teach our clients. So putting ourselves in their shoes, understanding their goals of impact, like Fran is saying, different regions have different goals of how they want to run their businesses. And building from that a shared understanding, I believe if we build that in a solid way, they will come. Give us shared understanding, Seppo, from a stepping back perspective, you talk about legacy. Well, developing nations have inherited a legacy of the way in which capital flows at the moment, the way in which they're lent to. Does that need to be upended at the moment? I don't get that. You say that from building a legacy? Yeah, from a lending, the way in which the world is set up yeah. to help finance okay. infrastructure spending. <laughs> Does that need to change in any way from your perspective? In a major way. Yeah. Uh, I think it is a it, it is a major issue. I mean, if you consider that at the current moment, I mean, the current situation we find ourselves in, that uh, with the inflationary pressures that we find, high interest rates, and if you consider that, I mean, at the moment, I mean, developing economies, I mean, the end user, from an uh, uh, use it, they have to like consume some of these products in local currency and local currency, but then they are funded, they are governments with expensive debt, which is like in hard currency, with like exorbitant sort of like interest rates that like you no know, are double what you find in like you know mature markets. I mean it's like a triple, quadruple sort of like whammy. So it's that vicious circle we can. I mean, I assure ourselves that it will just never end. Mm. So That's from that point of view, it's a, it's a certainty that the issue of addressing uh, the, 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 the poverty issue in those, in, in those environments will just go on and on until the issue of debt and its cost to those environments is addressed. Because I think it's also been proved that the default rates mm. are not as projected or the reality of them is not as high, or it's actually even better than what So has is that been about risk assessment? Is that about more innovation in ways that capital markets can allocate to risk? What, what needs to be done there? Or is it purely getting more analysts, analyzing individual countries and individual projects in a different manner? I think, you know, one of the things which needs to be done we need to take a longer term view on, I can mostly speak for, for the African continent and other developing economies. And we also need to ensure that perhaps we also have enough risk capital in that, I mean also equity capital that's brought to the table to ensure that those who come with debt do not call the shots all the time or that whatever they price it at is not pricing debt with like, you know, equity returns. Because that's the way debt behaves when it comes to like, you know, this developing market. It wants an equity return without taking those things. So, mm. But to the extent that that happens, I think even leaders from a government point of view need to do their bit. Because it's not as if they do not have the value which is there. Yeah. I think it is the value is lost somewhere you know, in the mix uh, to ensure that like, they do not have to like, no, negotiate at the disadvantage. I, I totally agree, and I think, again, it's just I'm going to try to hammer this point. The motivations that will actually move large amounts of capital is exactly what you're saying, meaning looking at longer horizon of, okay, what's the, what's the, uh, what's the risk and what's the return that I'm getting here? And everything that moved Europe in a big way, I think, is grounded in deep beliefs that the returns are gonna come, they matter. Uh, Trudeau talked about this yesterday, of like investing years ago and seeing that come today. Also, what about the risks? I mean, what risk are you accounting for? What risk are you not accounting for? And it's again why I think really nailing down how this works and what we believe will get more people to say, oh, I look at these investments and now I'm doing my ROI calculation and I'm getting to a different outcome because I'm thinking about it well. But near is that capitalism that fixes that? Because you just referenced a leader, a government focus, but how do you square that circle that really capitalism can be the driving force of change in the way you allocate money? Because I think the motivations, so 
capitalism, I think, and good capitalism, there's a lot of, uh, you can meet a lot of things, but common prosperity is the goal that we all share. I mean, every company is trying to create value, every society, every community is trying to create value. And in that sense, capitalism of, hey, we can collaborate, work together, and create more resources and, and, and more abundance for everybody, in that sense, I think, yes, totally capitalism. But we gotta think about it well, because we have to do the math right, and we have to think about the right time horizon in order to get the right solutions. But I th maybe just to come in on to what Peps is saying. From an issue of return point of view, it has been shown that you can get the appropriate return for that appropriate risk on the African continent or even in those markets. Yeah. So therefore, I think one of the issues that perhaps from a leadership point of view on the continent needs to be done is that to improve that narrative. But there are those projects, it has been shown for a long time that there is that. Uh, and, uh, but the issue of capital behaving in an appropriate manner towards the continent or in a responsible manner needs to be Address, but I think it's on both sides that we need to address that. Fran, you've managed to build a culture within, it feels like, that can take a longer term mindset. How much have you managed to ensure that all the stakeholders, investors, are always with you on that long term mindset too? Yeah, it's funny because we've been saying the word narrative. I think it's incredibly important. You know, the group that we haven't talked about are the employees, right? and employees want to work for companies that they believe in, companies where they see that they are taking the long-term view. You know, this conversation is interesting because when you talk about sustainability, it is one of the few times that you actually are talking about a business plan 25 and 30 years out. That doesn't happen. I think so many times we're focused on the quarter that we're in right now, and so what I would tell you is, when you look out that far, there's an amazing opportunity to embed the sustainability dialogue with your business strategy. Mm. And if you do that, that is an unlock in really how we work together. And you bring your employees along and you attract the best talent because they want to be a part of it. Perfect place to end it. What a wonderful conversation. Can I just give a shout out to Nia who had a baby just three <laughs> days ago and has come to spend time talking about this. What a wonderful conversation, Nir, Fran, Seppo. Thoroughly enjoyed it. It's going to be so interesting, of course, to, for all of us to see how investors, how corporates approach the issue of ethical investing in the future. Thank you for giving us just a little bit of a glimpse into what might happen.